I'm the director of Center for Korean Studies. Um, School, and, School of Music, Dance, and Theater is co-sponsoring uh, this event. Today we have three world-renowned experts in Korean music, Keith Howard, Jin Hee Kim, and Chan Eun Park on one stage, which is a rare and a very exciting opportunity. Um, there are several people I'd like to give a thanks to for making this event possible. Professor Charles Garrett and Joseph Lam in the Department of Musicology, and uh, Elder Sang Yong Nam and Mrs. Moon Suk Nam, friends and supporters of Center for Korean Studies. Um, now I would like to introduce Professor David Chung, a faculty member of CKS and professor in the School of Art and Design. He'll introduce the presenters today. Good afternoon. Thank you, Nojin. Um, we're, um, you're really in for a treat today, and thank you for coming out. Uh, it's really an extraordinary event. It really should last over several days, but we're going to try to fit it in in this um, short afternoon session. Um, a few years ago, um, well, the few years I spent as a child growing up in Korea, our house was filled with music of performers such as Lee Mi Ja, and I listened to Korean pop music of the day, even a band called the He Six, side by side with the occasional visit to hear traditional music, Korean folk music or court music. Now, at that time, I thought all that was Korean music. Uh, it wasn't until later that I came to the States that I learned about Bing Crosby, Patsy Cline, Muddy Waters, Bob Dylan, and even Purple Haze that I realized where the, some of the interactions were coming from. It was wonderful um, yesterday to hear Professor Keith Howard explain what was going on in my mind yesterday at his talk about um, Kugak music and Kugak fusion. Um, before I introduce him, I just want to talk about um, the uh, sort of the essence of what Korean music, what we're going to be talking about today. Last year, we had the great Korean linguistic scholar, Professor Youngmi Yu Cho, who came and she gave a wonderful historic view of how Korean language has existed over the centuries. And even um, through the years when <coughs> Korean was, um, we were using um, Chinese characters or through the invasions of different countries, um, the core of Korean language um, persevered and it had a kernel, a structure, which withstood these uh, many centuries of, of time as, and, and stands out today as a unique um, language. In this sense, um, this afternoon we're going, to, we're going to sort of look at what is the essence of Korean music, what makes Korean music. And we have, as Nojin Kwok, uh, Professor Nojin Kwok explained, we have three, we're really lucky to have three of the, the best possible people to explain, to, to look at this. Um, we have um, Professor Keith Howard, one of the world's foremost experts on Korean music, and we have two of the most highly acclaimed uh, practitioners as well with us today. Um, what we'll, we'll do is um, first, I'll each, uh, first we'll have a, a presentation by Professor Howard and then um, Jinny Kim will um, give a talk and afterwards um, Chan Park will give us a performance of Pansori. Afterwards we'll um, have an opportunity to have a little bit of a discussion, a panel discussion up here. To introduce um, Professor Keith Howard, he is Associate Dean, Research and Professor at Sydney Conservatorium of Music at the University of Sydney. Until 2009, he was Professor of Music at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, and I had the opportunity to meet him first there a few years ago. His publications include Korean Musical Instruments, A Practical Guide, Bands, Songs, and Shamanistic Rituals, True Stories of the Korean Comfort Woman, Korean Shamanism, Revival, Survivals, and Change, Korean Pop Music, Riding the Wave, Preserving Korean Music, Creating Korean Music, Zimbabwean Music on an International Stage, Korean Kayagum Sanjo, and the forthcoming Singing the Kyrgyz Manas. He is a regular broadcaster on Korean affairs for BBC, ITV, Sky, and NBC. He has given lect lectures, workshops, and performances in 
Britain, Asia, Australia, and America, and throughout Europe. Please help me in welcoming <laughs> Professor Howard. What an introduction. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me. Um, I think I was asked to speak about this book, essentially, Korean Kaigam Sanjo, which came out last year and is my 15th book, <clears throat> actually co-written with a Korean Sanjo performer. And that's the key, I think, to a lot of my work at the moment. It's very difficult to keep it short, though. So I'm talking about Sanjo. Let me start by defining it. The Korean genre of Sanjo comprises a set of related pieces for solo melodic instruments and drum that putatively evolved from genres of music characteristic of Korea's southwestern Chola provinces, with additional input from musicians familiar with the music of the central Chungcheong and Gyeonggi areas. Now today, a full performance will open, particularly when the solo instrument is the Kayagum zither, with what was once a tuning and adjustment section, the tassadum. It's non-metrical. And then it proceeds through a series of main movements, the first of which can last up to half the total, Chinyangjo. Um, it's a slow, steadily repeating 18-8 rhythmic cycle. It has the emotional core. Proceeds from there to gradually get faster. We go to Chungmori, a 12-form medium, and Dante, to those of you who are Western music musicians. Chungjung Mori, getting faster, Chajin Mori. And then it ends with a movement typically in 4-4. Four, four. So if we think of the initial movements as sort of 1-2-3, two, 2-2-3, three, 3-2-3, two, two, three, three, two, three, et cetera, that's triple time, it goes to 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and duple time, 4-4. Four, four. It can have additional movements as well. There's some at the bottom there, lilting dance like kutgori, onmori, huimori, and so on. Um, the set of movements then goes from slow and emotional to fast and light. It goes from the compound to duple, and each of the movements keeps one of these rhythmic cycles with those names. Um, that's quite small, but there they are, just the drum patterns. So we have Chin Yang Zhou at the top, 18 8, 1, 2, 3, 2, 2, 3, 3, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 5, 6, 2, 6, 2, 3, and back, 1, 2, 3. Repeating all the time, going down. I'm just going to show you by playing a few short clips, if I can. Missing out the introduction for the moment. So here's Chin Yang Zhou. Two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three, five, two, three, six, two, three, back. One. Again, those of you who are musicologically minded, downbeat is one, five and six is a sort of upbeat to bring you back. Now that might last half the movement, maybe half an hour in a full performance. And then we go on to a 12-4. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, chungmori. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one. Chung Chung Mori gets faster. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Ninth beat is accented. Chajin Mori. Oops. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hui 
everybody here is actually in 12-4. Here it is. Very fast. And then the resolution. One, two, three, four. One and two and three and four. And so on. So a performance can last up to an hour. You could shorten it as well. And this comes into the definition. So rhythmic cycles like these, which go round, they're not the same as a metre, they're not the same as Western music, but they provide a model, a sort of modelling structure, so that the musicians know exactly where they are. The drum typically will play the accented beats and the sort of up beats to get you back to a downbeat where everyone comes together. Um, the drum again is ubiquitous to all Korean music. You're going to hear some in the pansori, and it's difficult to imagine pansori without a drum. Today, sanjo pieces exist for most Korean instruments, including, am I on the right slide? Yes, I think so. Yeah, including the kayagum, the 12 string zither, um, and then in its earliest known adaptations for komungo, six string long zither, and tegum horizontal bamboo flute, then for the pidi oboe, tanso and tungso virtu vertical notched flutes, tepyongso shawm, and hegum two-string fiddle. Whereas the earliest sanjo that we know about is the late 19th century, in the 1970s, an ensemble sanjo also evolved. Now, the two Sino-Korean characters that comprise the term sanjo can be translated as scattered melodies. And the term is by some considered to have evolved from a Korean term, rather than Sino-Korean, hotun karak, which would translate as something like loosely organized melodies. Now those sort of translations do little to capture the depth and complex structure of a piece that can last an hour. An important consideration with which to begin is actually to account for how that music style developed. At one point, it appears to have been highly improvisational, perhaps individual, but it's evolved into a genre with a set of related, relatively fixed and unchanging pieces. I just played you segments from one Sanjo. It's the Kim Juk Pa Sanjo, Kim Juk Pa. Um, she'll come along in a minute. If we go right back, Sanjo masters and Korean musicologists typically resolve the issue of history by saying that Sanjo had a putative inventor, Kim Changjo. There are his dates. To my knowledge, the association with Kim actually starts in 1948 with a book by the scholar Ham Hwa Jin. So that's very early for Korean musicology. Um, now, Kim, we know he was born into an aristocratic family in Yongam County in today's South Chola province. His father was a petty official, a revenue collector. And as a child, the junior Kim proved reluctant to learn the necessary literary skills to enter the civil service, preferring rather to develop his artistic skills. We know that he'd begun to learn music by the time he was 10, and he first presented a solo performance of his Sanjo when he was 19. Different Sanjo pieces are associated with great players from the past, essentially who are his students or students of students. I'm gonna leave that for just a second when I say this. So the influence of Kim is recounted there in lots of texts. Each different piece tends to be named after a specific player, being defined in terms of a school, Ryu or Ryupa, borrowing a term from Japan. But actually in Korea, very different to Japan, because whereas a Ryu, a school in Japan, can go back a number of centuries, has one basic style, in Korea, one basic style and everyone learned from one person or their students. In Korea, it's been typical that you learn from one person, then you move to another, and so on. And then when you're an adult performer, you're going to develop your own style. It's much more flexible than the Japanese style. However, schools are in Korean lineages, lineages rather as in Japan, associated with, sorry, schools are associated with lineages. And this is a primary defining feature of the instrumental Sanjo traditions. 
Those traditions are preserved now in Korea as intangible cultural properties, Muyong Munaje, actually number 16, 23, and 45. Um, now, I consider that that linear history, while attractive, is actually too neat. And I remember the late ethnomusicologist Frank Harrison, who wrote a book called Time, Place, and Music, looking at missionary accounts of early music, pointed out that we don't actually know what music sounded like before about 1890, i.e., before the gramophone or the phonograph was invented. We imagine, but we don't really know. In Korea, what happens is that we know history through people who survived into the modern times. And that's the case with the idea of Sanjo. We know about Kim chang jo not because he recorded anything, he didn't, but because his students, the second generation, if you like, recorded things. Now, Ham Hwa Jin, the person who first made that association in 1948, was able to interview and, and work with musicians who remembered the way music was in the past. His account then becomes critical of our understanding of Sanjo. Why? Because nothing was written by previous generations, or when it was written, it may have been biased. It may have been written by the literati who didn't particularly like something coming out of folk music. There are difficulties there. So we are reliant on those sort of echoes of the past in people who survived. One of the most interesting echoes of the past if Ham Hwa Jin is discounted, so Ham was talking to all of these people who were alive in the 1940s. A second scholar is critical here, and that's Yi He Gu, who's just passed his centenary. Um, he's still alive. He, in the 1930s, was working for what was then um, the sole broadcasting station, so Kyongsong Pangsongguk. And he recorded one particular young star whose name was Kim Juk Pa third generation down there. Her significance, apart from the fact I've just played you parts of her Sanjo, is that she was the granddaughter of Kim chang jo the first person. She then disappeared from the 1930s and reappeared in the 1960s. What happened in between? Well, essentially the recording industry. So from the second decade of the 20th century, recording studios were set up in Seoul. Lots of performers recorded there. But remember that an old SP, a shellac disc, could only do three or three and a half minutes per side. So we don't get a feeling of Sanjo being a very long piece from their recordings. However, lots of recordings exist. And those recordings, we're talking about the 1920s to 1940s here, typically have the second generation performers on them. I'm going to tell you very quickly a little bit about some of these. Han Song Gi died essentially before musicology got going. Kim Byung-ho was there, but was not performing in, in later times. Cheok Sam is known largely through his students. Kang Tae Hong, okay. He was down to become one of the holders of the intangible cultural property, but he died the year he should have taken it up. And Kiok and Chong Nam Hee, very, very important in their time, but by the 1950s and 1960s in South Korea, unfortunately they'd moved to North Korea, they were deleted from the accounts. They're not there in histories until very recently. They were there in North Korea, but never mind. And also from beyond Chola, we have two others, Pak Sang Gun and Shim Sang Gom. Now, you can see there are other people there. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong screen. That's what's going on. Sorry. Most of them by the 1960s, by the time that LPs and long recordings were made, had died or were too ill to, to perform. And so the first people who were there and who we can still hear in extended versions of Sanjo are the third generation. And there's four people that I've mentioned. So Kim Juk Pa first. I hope I have a picture of Kim Juk Pa. There she is. So a wonderful performer probably 1911 to 1989. Slightly difficult to tell because her birth was not recorded. This is the beginning of the Japanese period. If you recorded births, essentially you had to send people to school. It didn't happen for a lot of women. In fact, we don't even know what her name was when she was born. Chukpa, Kim Chukpa, 
is a name given to her by her second husband. She trained as a kizeng, um, entertainment girl, something like that, but of high artistic merit. And in the late 1920s, when she was still a teenager, she started recording for, for radio and for one or two SP discs. Then in 1932, she married her first husband, and her husband said, it's not right for an, up, for an upright um, sort of um, high-class person to perform music. So she was forbidden. And she didn't perform at all in public in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and actually the 60s. However, in the 1960s, when scholarship was getting going, and a program in Seoul National University started teaching people for degrees to play music, traditional Korean music, Lee Hae Gu, who was running that program, told one of his um, students, whose name was Lee Chae Suk or Chae Suk Lee, I know this really good person, and you should really go and study with her because she's the only link living back to the putative founder, Kim Chang Jo. Lee Chae Suk was married to a person who was related to Kim Juk Pa's husband. And so she was able to phone her up do some negotiations, and she was able to go and start studying with Kim Juk Pa. So Lee Chae Suk was the first person to perform her Sanjo in public, which had gone through some changes. And it was only when Kim Juk Pa's husband died in 1977 that Kim Juk Pa came back into the public arena. Now that's really important because when South Korea started promoting for preservation its genres, it appointed human cultural properties into intangible cultural properties. And so for Sanjo and Kaigam Sanjo, it couldn't appoint Kim Juk Pa, she wasn't performing. There'd be no point in that. It first appointed Song Gum Yeon and Kim Yun Dok. Now Song Gum Yeon is interesting partly because her second husband, again, she was a, a Kizeng, an entertainment girl, her second husband came from Gyeonggi, the area around Seoul. And so her Sanjo had taken in aspects of, of, of that region's music. And so to some people, it was not traditional enough. She also caused a problem because in the 1970s, she moved to Hawaii. And the Koreans said, well, you can't really preserve a genre of our traditional music if you're not even living in the country. So she was stripped of her title. The second person appointed in the beginning, and this is sort of in the late 60s, was Kim Yun Dok. Kim Yun Dok, again, quite interesting, because he had learnt from Chong Nam Hee, a lot of names here, but Chong Nam Hee had gone to North Korea. So the school of Chong Nam Hee was known as Kim Yun Dok. Um, many people knew there was a problem there, but they couldn't say anything. When Song Gum Yeon was stripped of her title because she went to Hawaii, so another human cultural property was appointed by the government, which is going down the list, if you like, and that was Ham Dong Jongwol, another former um, entertainment girl, Kizeng. By the time she was appointed quite a recluse, and she played what became known as a very masculine style. If you look further up, she studied with Che Yok Sam on the first um, highlighted line. So, those were the performers. Um, Kim Yun Dok died in 1980, but essentially his place was taken by Kim Juk Pa. We go from there to a fourth generation of players who are today's players Yi Yong Hee, Byung Gi Hwang, Yang Sung Hee, Mun Jae Suk. Again, lots of politics comes in here. Yi Yong Hee learnt from Kim Yun Dok not from Chong Nam Hee. So she learned from a third generation person. She was appointed essentially when everyone else had died. Byung Huang has not been appointed a human cultural property. He's very well known. He may have been here. Um, he's a master Kayagam player, composer. Um, many of you will know of him. Then we come to the other two there, Yang Sung Hee and Mun Che Sok. Oh, I should say that Byung Huang one significant thing here is he was on the committee to elect people to these human cultural properties. So he had something to do with Yong Hee being elected. 
Yang Sung Hee and Mun Jae Suk, they were both students of Kim Juk Pa. And they've only been appointed um, human cultural properties for a few years. There were lots of arguments here as to whether they needed the nomination and whether one should be appointed over the other. Okay. I want to go back to... How did that come up? Sorry. More of the evolution. And I'm going to go away from this slide and just suggest a few things. No, I'll go to there. That's right. A variety of solo instrumental music swirled around the 19th century Korean countryside. The folk music specialist Ibo Hyong once wrote, I'm quoting, there was Sanjo-like music before Kim Changjo. Kim must be placed within the continuous development of Sanjo, just as the excellence of Bach's fugues lies in factors such as his great skill in counterpoint, mastery of formal structures, advanced harmonic treatments, and so on. So Kim's great achievement was to establish the overall form of the genre played in his day or to his day. Nonetheless, we've got the idea of Sanjo schools coming from him. And I wonder what the 19th century would have looked like. What sort of music was there? If we try to trace some roots, we get a long way back. In one stream, and Korean musicologists, including Ham Hwa Jin, have suggested this, Sanjo seems to come from something called Shim Bangok. Now, in the, in the 15th century, Song Hyun, who's well known as a, as a scholar at that point, writes of a Shim Bangok style which accompanied dance and song. That would be all right, because he's writing as a Confucian. A century later, another scholar, E. Ik, writes that it's actually shaman instrumental music. So could this stuff, called Sanjo, have its roots back in shamanism? Yes, it could. And it could not least, because if I go back to all those performers I've mentioned as um, Kizeng, entertainment girls, a huge number of them were actually from shaman families. Musicians had very few chances of getting out of a very low status caste, the chonmin. They had to become musicians, dancers, butchers, hangmen, one or two other things. So if you were born to a shaman, you had very limited opportunities in life. One of the things you could do to escape shamanism and, 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 and the, the problems associated with working with the spirit world was to become a musician or dancer. So many female musicians come from that background. That's very tempting to suggest it comes from um, something in, in shamanism. Another idea which was promoted by a folk music scholar called Pak Hong Bong, who's well known for, for setting up the Kugak High School, so the high school for traditional music, which took in a lot of folk music specialists in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. He wrote that perhaps we could trace Sanjo back to the 6th century and to Uruk, who was the person who invented this instrument, the Kayagum, the 12 strings zither, or so says a legend. And it's a legend in a 12th century Korean history book, the Samguk Sagi. Essentially, that legend says that the king was or heard somebody playing a Chinese zither and said, look, our language is different, therefore we have to have our own instruments to play our own music. Uruk went off and supposedly invented the Kayagum. Now, the legend is complex, not least, because there are Kayagum-like instruments predating it, predating the time. We know that Uruk um, in the 6th century is a, a physical person. Um, the Kaya Federation, which was allied to Japan at the time, declined and was taken over by the Shilla kingdom to the southeast. Um, Uruk moved to Shilla, and the pieces he'd created for the Kayagum, the record says there were 12 pieces, were then adapted for Shilla court use into five pieces. So we have the names, we know quite a bit about them. We know that that was the Kayagum as well, so okay, maybe that followed through, but it's a huge long way from the sixth century through to the 19th century. There's another aspect of the history of Kayagum of, of Kayagum Sanjo to consider, and that's this genre at the bottom, Kayagum Pyeongchang, the genre of songs plus zither. So where a singer accompanies, self-accompanies themselves on the zither. 
And this is typically associated with the, the Kizeng Entertainment Girls. And many of the songs come from Pansori. We're going to hear some Pansori shortly. Pansori I translate as epic storytelling. There's just a statistic. If you go through all the SP and radio broadcasts of Sanjo from the 1920s to 1940s, you find 33 players, that's quite a lot in number, female players, who recorded both the Pyeongchang songs and Kaigam Sanjo. So we have something of a history. Anyway, here are the schools and how they followed through. Um, so from Kim Changjo through a second generation to his granddaughter, Kim Chukpa. But really, she only studied with him for at the most six months. So she studied from other people as well. Her students are Yang Sung Hee and Mun Che Suk. So whereas Kim Juk Pa was one of the, the holders of the intangible cultural property in the 70s and 80s, Yang Sung Hee and Mun Che Suk are today. From Kim Byung Ho, at the moment I've marked him down as um, teaching Kim Yun Dok. Um, don't worry about that at the moment. Che Ok Sam through to Ham Dong Jong Wol. Kang Tae Hong, no real sort of successor. Ang Ki Ok, initially taught Chong Nam Hee, though their Sanjos are considered slightly different. And Chong Nam Hee taught Kim Yun Dok and Song Gum Yon. Park Sang Gun, who wasn't from Chola, from the central region, Chung Chong Do, taught Song Gum Yon. Two plus five gives you Kim Yun Dok, who passes it on to Yi Yong Hee, another holder, and potentially to, to Byung Gi Hwang. No two scholars agree on exactly what the schools are. Hmm, this is slightly worrying. What scholars do agree about is that Sanjo is not just those rhythmic cycles that I played at the beginning, but melodically works with three central modes. Most scholars will tell you that those modes come from Pansori, and they might do, but on the, on the Kayagum, they have a significance. So here are the modes. The first is Kim Yonjo. It's a characteristic mode of folk songs in the southwest, in Chola. Um, it has five pitches, if you like, but three are characteristic. And those, each of those three has characteristic treatments, which gives it a very sad and emotional content. Um, singers, for instance, talk about having an ewan chong, a very sad voice. Sulpan, sorry, this sort of thing. The three are a central tone, the pon chong, with very little vibrato. The low dominance, for those of you who are music, musicologists, a ton and mock, a low vibrating trembling tone. And then above those two, a higher tone that falls. Now, I'm not a very good singer and my voice isn't good, but one of the characteristic songs from down there is Kang Gang Sule. Kang Gang Sule, steady tonic. Kang vibrato, Kang Su, that's a falling tone. Le. Kim Yonjo. Very, very typical. So now if you hear anybody singing from the Southwest, you're going to hear those tones. You know what they are. The other modes don't come from the Southwest. We start with Pyongjo. It's considered further north, maybe Chungcheong up to Kyonggi. So the central to, um, provinces and the area around Seoul, but particularly the central one. Again, five pitches, but Pyongjo is straighter. It doesn't have the grandeur we might have. It's for everyday, ordinary melodies. Melodies tend to have narrow intervals and are very singable, except I'm not going to sing it to you. Just that, OK? Compared to those, the third mode, ujo, again five pitches, but this one descends from court music. It's used for solemnity. It's used for grand, serious passages. Now, in Pansori, that's going to be when dignitaries or people from the court magistrates, lawyers, these people come on stage. Whereas local love stories, is gonna, it's going to be in Kim Yonjo all the time. And then when you have sort of everyday experiences in, Pyong, in, in Pansori, the singer is going to use Pyongjo. For Sanjo, what happens here is that the modes fit the instrument brilliantly. And this is how a lot of the development of the, the melodic content of Sanjo happens. So the Kayagum in a 15th century representation on the left there has 12 strings. For Sanjo, those strings are typically tuned 
something like that, G, C, D, G, A, C, D, E, G, A, C, D. So it's two and a half octaves, you can see three Gs. Um, the bottom octave has less tones than anything else. If we were to map the modes onto these things, we'd get Kemionjo looking for G, A, C, D, E. C underlined means that's the, the tonic, the steady tone. G is the one that needs the vibrato. E and D are the two falling tones. D, D, D. Okay, so that's all right. You could also do it up a, a fifth, so D, E, G, G, A, B. So if you want to lighten the mode or the mood suddenly, let's go up a fifth. At which point we've got a problem. And the problem is the thing that's marked and shaded, B. It's not there on the instrument. So what does somebody do on the instrument? Well, actually, the player is required to take the C string, the string that's tuned to C, and if you imagine the instrument with a bridge in the middle, beyond the bridge, they pluck here, beyond the bridge, they pull the string upwards, which makes the tone go down. Now, it's a very, very sort of flexible thing. It's not necessarily accurate. Therefore, when you go up to that D-E-G-A-B version of Kemionjo, that B tends to go closer to C. Now, whenever that happens, the music tends to move to another mode. And the mode it will typically go to is Ujo, which is a C, D, E, G. So B becomes C. Fairly straightforward. Again, Ujo is very well suited to the instrument. And remember I said it's pedestrian, it's every day. Of course it's every day because it fits the instrument without having to put much ornamentation or anything to complicate things. Pyongjo, though, has another um, challenge. And the challenge, you can see it there, G, A, C, D, F, is the F. The instrument is not tuned to F. This time, instead of pulling the string to lower it, you take the E string, so as if it's G, A, C, D, E, and you stretch the E string so that the tone goes up. It becomes F. So you can see what's going to happen here. The F, as you're stretching it, isn't very accurate always. It can easily become E again. What happens when it becomes E? It moves back towards Kemionjo. So somehow, if these modes started somewhere else, maybe in Pansori, on this instrument for Sanjo, they become interpreted in very different ways. And that interpretation leads, as far as I can see, to the melodies that we have in Sanjo. Now, I know I haven't got much time. I would like to tell you a little bit about other instruments. Um, and I wanted to play part of the piece as well. So I'm going to play just a couple of, well, about 30 seconds of the piece. This is the tuning section right at the beginning. Um, and all I wanted to show you is essentially you can hear a lot of movement of changing the pitches by pulling the strings and pushing them. Um, now I've got to go back to it. Here we go. First line, there. It's in an awful clef, for those of you who read staff notation. So this is totally unmetered. Each of the double slashes means the end of a phrase. We're now on the third one and the third line. Okay, now if I was to spend half an hour on this, 
I'd be able to show you how the thing moves from Pyongjo, a fairly straightforward mode, into Kemyonjo. And it does it by shifting those strings in exactly the way I've told you. Just to finish, because I know we've got very little time here, I wanted to briefly mention Sanjo for other instruments and then suggest something for the future. The first known occurrence of the Sanjo for a second instrument, the six strings of the Kumungo, which um, Jin He plays, so we'll hear about that in a minute, is actually 1896. And it's with a person called Peknak Chun. Same thing happens here that schools are identified, Shin Kui Dong and Han Gap Tuk. Um, rather than the first person, the second generation and then onwards. Um, it's also known as Sanjo for the transverse bamboo flute, the tegum. The first known performer here is Pak Chong Gi, who was a shaman in the southwestern island of Chindo. He's particularly well known for the, the flute player. He recorded a lot for, for radio and um, for SP recordings. We've got something like 240 records of what he did there, including 13 Sanjo performances. Um, when the intangible cultural property was announced, he wasn't there. For some reason, perhaps because of the shaman connection, and Korea was modernizing at the time, a second person was appointed holder. That was Kang Bek Chon down the bottom, passing through, and you can see how the lines go in terms of schools. Pak Chong Gi's Sanjo school has become more important in recent years, um, particularly with So Yong Sok and Yi Seng Gang. You can see them there. The next instrument for which it developed was the two-stringed fiddle, the Hegum. Han Bom Su is the person associated with this. And Han Bom Su developed his Sanjo, he says, or said, because he heard Pak Chong Gi. So in his youth, he was very, very influenced by this shaman musician. From there we go to Piri, Hajeng, Tungso, Tanso, Tepyongso, etc. for other instruments. So by now, we've got Sanjo for virtually every instrument, not literally until the 1980s. In the 1980s, along came a pop musician to devise something called Guitar Sanjo. And a number of composers have come in and put their own Sanjos down in various ways. One of the most recent Sanjo developments is Kim Dok Su, who is well known for Samul Nari, and um, he was a child prodigy as a drummer. He's still playing. In 2004, he set down his Chango Sanjo. Now, since the Chango normally accompanies Sanjo, it's now the soloist. That's kind of curious. It hasn't been issued on recording yet. Um, a few of us are trying to persuade Kim that he needs to do that. Anyway, in the 1960s, just to finish the story, because universities were starting to teach Sanjo alongside other genres of Korean music, so they needed notations. Notations had never been part of the tradition until that point. But in the 1960s, each of the Sanjo schools was written down, even though there's some competition about what the schools are. And on the basis of those notations, people have analyzed them and started to describe what's going on. What's happened with the notations is if you're a student you go to your class and you learn exactly what your teacher's teacher back to the second or third generation played. So from a genre which was very, very flexible in the past, we've got a, a genre which is now fixed within the set number of schools. Because of that, it's actually very difficult to work out and predict what will happen in the coming years. If it's a fixed repertory, well, what chance is there for it to develop and remain vital and vibrant in Korea? A number of Korean musicians are coming forward and saying, well, I need to develop my own school, and my own school will reflect the current times. Whether they're able to depends on, I guess, internal politics. In recent years, we've seen Byonggi Huang, who I've mentioned a couple of times, develop his school on the basis of his teacher, but also on the basis of what he found in North Korea when he went there in 1990. Um, his teacher was Kim Yun Dok, but Kim Yun Dok's teacher was Chong Nam Hee. Chong Nam Hee went to North Korea. So Huang Byonggi went to North Korea with some Korean musicians, 
and in the Pyongyang Music and Dance College, he was given a cassette recording of Chong Nam Hee playing just before he died. On the basis of that and his own teacher, he's put together what he calls his school in Chong Nam Hee style. Other musicians have done the same. Um, Park Pom Hun, who's now the, the principal or rector of Chungang University, is one of those. Uh, so Yong Sok, Kim Yong Jae, there's a number of them. And yet they're still very, very traditional. They're still bound by something in the past. The hope for the future actually lies somewhere else. If Sandra is going to evolve, it's going to evolve in forms which are sort of populist, which take us into new territory. And that, I think, is where the guitar Sanjo and Kim Dok Su's Chango Sanjo hold out all sorts of hope for future vitality in this genre. It would be very nice to stop now and have a Sanjo performance. <laughs> That's not really possible, though Jin Hee Kim is going to come and talk about her experiences of music, and I think she's going to make some reference to Sanjo as she does so. So thank you very much.